Really. Um, I'd like to uh, take a moment and introduce our keynote speaker, Yatia Hopkins. Tia, um, global award-winning cybersecurity executive, educator, mentor, speaker, and author focused on innovative thought leadership and creating opportunity and diversity in cybersecurity industry. Um, I don't know how many awards you've won for Women of the Year, Women in Cybersecurity of the Year, all women teaching in Cybersecurity of the Year. I don't know. There's so many of them. <laughs> I don't have a list of them. I don't think it would fit on this screen anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, I would like to welcome you know, Tia Hopkins to the, to the stage. I always get really embarrassed when I get uh, introduced because I'm like, all I do is wake up in the morning, do a couple nice things, and uh, go to bed at night. That's the goal. Let me find my, my clicker. I think I put my clicker in my bag. One second. All right, so we're going to talk about what classic arcade gaming can teach us about cybersecurity. And by the end of this thing, you'll tell me whether I'm onto something or not. And I'm open to the honesty. So let's get right into this thing. So when I was thinking about this, uh, this presentation, I took a step back and I'm like, OK, when I hear ghosts in the machine, what, what do I think about? And the first thing that came to mind, honestly, was when you take your car to the mechanic for making that noise that it makes all the time, the really, really annoying noise, but then you get there and it doesn't make the noise anymore, right? And the mechanic's like, well, if you could just show me what it's doing, that'd be great. That's, that's fantastic. Maybe we could do something about it. So I was like, well, you know, I don't know that folks attending a cybersecurity conference would want to spend an hour talking about auto mechanics, so I'm going to need something else here. So I turn to my most trusted advisors for some advice, my two sons, 14 and eight years old. So I asked my 14-year-old, hey, what do, you, what do you think when you hear ghosts in the machine? And he's like, oh, mom, it's definitely the ghosts in the dryer. I do my laundry, I wash it, I dry it, I fold it all up, I'm missing a sock, I look everywhere for it, okay? I can't find it, I finally make peace, and say goodbye to the lonely sock in my drawer, and then all of a sudden, it's back in the dryer. I don't understand. Mom, it's very frustrating. I said, son, I, I understand, I agree with you. That was number two on my list. I still got this cybersecurity problem. So I turned to my eight-year-old, this guy's a genius, and he says, well, it's a ghost, and it's coming after you, so you gotta run away, and it's in a game, and you're trapped. And also, can I have a donut? Th thanks, kid. Appreciate that. Sure, you can have a donut. So they're both like, Mom, what is this for? Why are you asking us this? I was like, well, I'm speaking at a cybersecurity summit, and the theme is ghosts in the machine, so I got to talk about ghosts in the machine. Does that change your answers? Nope. Say, so, all right, good talk, guys. Thanks. So I turned to uh, the actual um, the blurb of the conference itself. And so I wanted to bring it up here just in case anyone hadn't had the opportunity to, to see it, and I'll read through it. So it's when our computers do something unexpected or start to make changes to documents and auto-launch things we didn't click on, randomly reboot, we call it a ghost. And when it's extreme, we call it a menacing ghost. So today I'm, I'm going to eventually get to the point <laughs> of talking about the ghosts in the machines of our cybersecurity programs. But first, a bit more on my process. So this was my presentation a short while ago. This was all of it. And I don't know what I was going to talk about with this for, for an hour. But um, eventually, a light bulb went off. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't think about this before. My, most, my, my earliest memories of ghosts in the machine went a little something like this. <laughs> Yes, Pac-Man. The first ghost ever in a machine in my life. And so I'm an educator, 
okay? So you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit here. You never know, maybe there's someone that doesn't know what Pac-Man is, so let's go through this. So it's an action maze game, right? We're moving Pac-Man through this maze, we're trying to eat dots, and we're trying to avoid ghosts. Tia's definition, most iconic arcade game ever. A few facts about the game. The objective is to eat all the dots in the maze while avoiding the ghosts. There are 244 dots in the maze, 240 tiny ones, and the four power-up uh, dots. You get points by eating the dots, eating the vulnerable ghosts, which turn blue when you eat a power-up dot, and fruit. 255 levels. Now, a couple of fun facts. After you pass level 19 in this game, the ghosts don't turn blue anymore, and the game isn't actually over at level 255. It's just unplayable after that because once you get to 256, half the screen glitches uh, due to an integer overflow, which is so strange, but people still continue to play. There's a whole write-up on how you can still continue to play while not being able to see half of the screen. It's insane. Almost done with this. <laughs> so quick history lesson. The game was released in Japan in May of 1980, and that's the name of it. Um, feel free to read that. I cannot. Uh, in 1980, in October, Midway purchased the rights to Pac-Man. And so when the translation came over, because Pac-Man looked like a hockey puck, this is, I thought this was really funny and interesting, it was translated to Puck-Man, which didn't last very long because they were concerned about arcade games being defaced with the P being turned into a different letter, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so they changed it to Pac-Man, which is actually closer to the original intention um, when it was uh, released in Japan because the Japanese name actually translates to something closer to Paku Paku, which means to gobble things up. So changing it from Pac-Man to Pac-Man actually got us closer to um, what was originally intended. 1982, my fave, Miss Pac-Man was released. And then in 2021, some keynote speaker randomly uh, try to associate Pac-Man with cybersecurity. So I'd say the game's having a pretty good run. All right, so let, let's get into this thing and meet our ghosts uh, in the machine. We have Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde. And I think this slide right here is enough to tie it to cybersecurity because Blinky, Pinky, Inky, you get in a groove, you're expecting something like Stinky, maybe, and you get Clyde. And cybersecurity, as soon as we think we found a pattern, well, then we find an anomaly and we're back to the drawing board. So just a bit about the, the names here. Blinky's our chaser, and in the midway version, um, we call uh, Blinky's shadow. Pinky's our ambusher, and midway called him speedy, which the speedy translation in the US is not really, really accurate because Pinky's not faster than any of the other ghosts, so ambusher is actually more accurate. Inky is intended to be unpredictable. Uh, U.S. translation is bashful and Clyde. Uh, feigned ignorance and pokey. So we're gonna talk about the personalities of these ghosts and that's how we're gonna get into cybersecurity. But first, one more detour. What about Sue? Anybody think about Sue when I was going through the ghosts? I was thinking about Sue. I was like, what happened with Sue? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, Sue did not release with Pac-Man. She released with Miss Pac-Man. So I just, this slides for me more than anything, so thanks for hanging out with me. All right, so Tia, what does all of this have anything to do with cybersecurity? And the connection for me is TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of these ghosts. So why are they even doing the things that they're doing? How are they doing the thing that they're doing? and what specifically enables them to do the things that they're doing. And we're gonna tie those things uh, to some cybersecurity concerns that we should be paying attention to in the coming 12 to 18 months. So in terms of what to look, at, uh, what to look out for, so East Entire has a team of individuals that uh, do threat intel research, uh, look for advanced detection mechanisms to, to enable us to find uh, more I would say advanced ways to detect and respond to attacks, and then we have a team that creates or writes the run books associated with those detections, and then we also have a team of distinguished security professionals that also do research and come up with innovative ideas to contribute to our efforts as well. And these teams are constantly performing research into trends, 
uh, what's happening in the industry, what should organizations be paying to, uh, paying attention to. So, so this is a, a lot of what I'm going to go over here is, uh, is their research. So we'll start with Blinky. The tactic for all these ghosts, the dead giveaway, is to catch Pac-Man. I mean, yeah, just in case you didn't know. Blinky's technique is to meet Pac-Man where he is, okay? And the way that he does that, Blinky's procedure is to target Pac-Man's current tile. So Pac-Man moves through the maze on tiles. There are tiles in the background of the screen that you typically can't see. So when Blinky is targeting uh, Pac-Man, what he does is look for the tile that he's in, and he just goes right there. So for me, mentally, that translates to attackers meeting our users where they are in order to infiltrate our environments. So what popped into my mind when I was thinking about Blinky was initial access. And so attackers are becoming a lot more innovative when it comes to how they're approaching getting into our environments to, to achieve or to accomplish their objectives. And the reality of it is our technologies are becoming more and more advanced. They're able to detect a lot more things. Our response capabilities, both in our organizations, with our service providers, are becoming more advanced. We're becoming more aware. So why deal with all that? You know, time is money in our world, but time is money in it also in their world. So why not just trick a user into doing what I need them to do so I don't have to worry about circumventing all these technologies? And I'm sure a lot of these you're familiar with, but when it comes to search engine optimization, that one kind of blew my mind when I started reading about it. Attackers are actually leveraging search engine optimization to plant information into um, what users will find when they go to web browsers. So you go to Google and you're looking for, you got to put a presentation together. So you need a template. I needed a template for this presentation. So users search for these templates and they find them, but they're actually executables. But attackers are using search engine optimization to make sure that these searches come up higher in the chain or higher uh, in the search results for users. And so users will download these, click on them thinking, oh, I've got this amazing uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to modify. It's a drive-by download. They're in your environment, off to the races. And I think that is totally in insane. Um, but also what that says, and um, the keynote yesterday was saying a lot of this as well, our, the attackers are using the same technologies we are, but more so than they have been ever uh, in the past. So, you know, you think about something as simple as search engine optimization, all the way up to something as advanced as artificial intelligence and attacks that are being enabled with artificial intelligence. So moving on to supply chain compromise, I mean, there's no secret, um, you know, with what's going on there. You think about the solar winds hack, all things where, you know, they are targeting a different target to get to the ultimate outcome. So I don't think I need to spend too much time on that. And then zero day vulnerabilities, right? The idea there being patch, patch, patch. So with initial access, we have to make sure our users are aware. We have to go back to basics and make sure we're regularly patching. And we also have to continuously validate the security practices and controls in place for our third party partners and vendors, okay? Moving on to Pinky. Tactic, you guessed it, catch Pac-Man. Technique, predict where Pac-Man is going. And Pinky's procedure is to target four tiles ahead of Pac-Man's current tile. So wherever Pac-Man is, Pinky is going to calculate four tiles ahead of that and go there. But I mean, dead on, just coming after Pac-Man like nothing ever. So when I think of Pinky, I think, okay, my blood pressure's going up, Pinky's that ghost that causes me to make really poor decisions in the game and make bad choices, and it's usually Pinky um, that catches me. So what that made me think of is ransomware and where ransomware is going, right? My first memories of, of ransomware were, okay, we encrypted your data, pay us, and we'll give it back to you. But that is advanced because we started to say, well, my data's backed up, have fun. So then attackers came back and said, I see your backup and I raise you the fact that I have found it and deleted it, so what now? And we're like, wow, all right, well, let me think about this. All right, well, I got more backups, I'm fine. And the attackers are like, all right, well, I've got your backup, but I also have your data, and if you don't pay me, I'm gonna leak it on the dark web. So how about that? And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and the idea behind ransomware 
now is just apply all the pressure to get what, what, what they want. And something else that, that the keynote mentioned uh, yesterday was that a lot of, in a lot of cases, these attackers know how much your cyber insurance policy will pay. And so they leverage that information to set the ransom that they're gonna charge you to not only release your data to you, but also not serve it up uh, on the dark web, which is, which is crazy. Um, so I covered, and, and then um, just I skipped over the point of expansion to cloud and mobile. I mean, if I think about my personal machine, if something on my personal computer were to get ransomed, I'd, I'd be okay. But if something happened to my iPhone, I, I'd probably lose my mind, right? And, and I think most of us are in that situation where a lot of times we live on our devices. I'll be sitting at my desk, my laptop is right in front of me, and I'm emailing and doing all kinds of things on my phone and cloud as well. You think about ransomware in the case of like a, a data center or on-prem environment uh, spreading from, from server to server and encrypting files in a share. Think about what would happen if that happened in SharePoint. That would be in, in, insane. And these are the directions that, that these, uh, these attacks are heading. Wherever attackers think we're going, that's where they want to be so that we can say, so that they can say when we come back to them with, well, yeah, we got this, we're not going to do that. Yeah, we already got that. So yeah, go ahead, go ahead and pay that money. And then lastly, ransomware as a service and specialization. This thing is, it's a full on business. It's not opportunistic. It's not a few guys hanging out in a basement seeing who they can get money from. These ransomware gangs are operationalizing their businesses and their gangs the way we operationalize our security teams. And they're specializing now. It's, it's okay, I'm going to specialize in um, initial entry. I'm going to specialize in establishing a foothold. Uh, I'm going to specialize in the distribution of the malware and I'm going to specialize in achieving those objectives. And like they're building partnerships like our organizations build partnerships, right? Like, oh, I'm a managed services provider. I'm gonna partner with this security firm to deliver a full package to my customers. And ransomware group gangs are doing the exact same thing, which makes it incredibly challenging for us. And another thing that they're doing is actually releasing the information around how they're doing the things that they're doing so it becomes public knowledge, which makes attribution incredibly, incredibly hard. All right. Inky. Inky is unpredictable, but he also wants to catch Pac-Man. His technique is to be confusing. And this one I'm gonna have to look at my notes for because it is, um, it's pretty insane. So the way he establishes his target is by calculating, it's a combination of Pac-Man's location and Blinky's location. So if Pac-Man's here and Blinky's here, all right, Inky draws a vector between the two, doubles it, and that's where Inky goes for Pac-Man, which makes it very unpredictable because Blinky is also moving. So for Inky, he's the only ghost that considers multiple factors when targeting Pac-Man. So that made me think of the spike that we can expect in identity-based attacks when it comes to multi-factor authentication, OAuth phishing, and deep fake phishing. So multi-factor authentication interception. What are we talking about here? That's, you know, if you're using SMS, which by the way is considered, I mean multi-factor, listen, don't get me wrong, we all need multi-factor authentication. I'm shocked um, when I have conversations where it's not in place. And we're getting better, but we also need to get to a place where it's enforced. And I, I understand that it's a, it's a huge lift, right? It's a bit of a lift to get multi-factor authentication rolled out to the organization, to get users to adopt it, et cetera, but it's a much, much bigger problem when you don't have it in place and then you're dealing with some sort of event because an attacker was able to gain access to your environment. So anyway, back to um, SMS. So SMS is considered one of the, um, the least secure methods for multi-factor authentication because of its susceptibility to interception. So if I'm just getting a text message on my phone, to, to, to serve as my means for multi-factor authentication, you think about things like SMS, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, SIM swapping, not SMS, SIM swapping. When, you, uh, when an attacker uh, leverages social engineering to, to dupe a, a provider, a cell service or mobile service provider into moving service from a phone number to a different SIM that they have control over. 
or move the service to an entirely different provider altogether, right? So that's why that's considered um, one of the least secure methods. Again, that's, that's a lot of work, and the idea here is not to say, oh, I have multi-factor authentication, so we're totally safe, we're good. Well, we, all, we all know better than that, because if anything in this industry, tools, processes, whatever, if anything just worked, we'd all be out of work, and we wouldn't be having these conferences, and I'd be doing my dream job um, popping popcorn at a movie theater. I'm gonna do that one day, I promise. Um, so the, the most secure method of um, multi-factor authentication today is considered mobile push. And one-time password is another uh, mechanism, but that's also susceptible to, again, social engineering because a user could be tricked into giving that password up or to um, you know, logging in and providing their credentials and the one-time password into a malicious website. Um, but mobile push, it's just a push right to the device, right? Did you, did you request authentication to this thing? The user accepts and, and you're fine. But the, the sort of caveat there is that you want to make sure that when the user is accepting that, they, there's a way you can indicate where the request is coming from, right? Because a lot of times we're busy, something comes through, you get this request and, oh yeah, I think I maybe tried to log into OneDrive uh, two hours ago, so yeah, I'll go ahead and accept that thing. But if you have the time and you have where the request came from, the user can clearly see, well, I'm sitting in my home office in New York, why in the world did this come from Kalamazoo? At least that's something to tip the user off to maybe I shouldn't be approving this thing, okay? OAuth phishing. OAuth phishing, well, OAuth, let's talk about that first. That's what like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, uh, these organizations use to authenticate applications to have access to user data. Uh, so for example, you book a flight through Expedia and all of a sudden it shows up on your Google Calendar, okay? OAuth, OAuth phishing is really just phishing still, right? Where attackers are trying to get users to give them this information, give me access to your account so I can set up forwarders, so I can get access to being connected into the same things that you're connected into and I can send emails and I can change your information, I can do these things. Again, social engineering. At the crux of all this is social engineering and, and I get a lot of eye rolls when I talk about user education, security awareness training, but at the end of the day, that's what it's coming down to, all right? And then deep fake phishing has to be the one that scares me the most because it's, we're very excited about AI and all the things that AI means in terms of what we'll be able to do. Um, there was a video played yesterday where it was like, if you're a busy CEO, wouldn't you love the ability to just record your voice and have it be learned and be able to uh, make statements and put out uh, announcements and things like that without ever having to be there, without ever having to find time in your busy schedule to do so? Well, yeah, that's awesome, except that someone else could also do that and make me say all sorts of things that I never said. Um, and we're starting to see in the news where uh, deep fake phishing is being leveraged to you know, trick people into making payments or to, to deliver false information. Uh, so this is, this is very scary. And the, the idea of remote work and the distributed workforce makes this um, really a really big concern because you have, you think about it, you have individuals that were hired, say, during COVID that have never even seen their boss, never met their boss, doesn't know the, the posture, the, the body language of their boss. And so if they get a voicemail that's a deep fake and their boss is saying, I need you to wire a million dollars to blah, 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 well, I mean, most likely they're gonna do it, especially if there's some sort of emotional driver behind it. I need you to do this before end of day or we're gonna lose this deal. Like all those emotional things that, that really good uh, social engineering attackers pile on uh, to drive uh, users to do what they want them to do, so. Moving on to Clyde. I roll my eyes every time I say Clyde. I really have a problem with this name. I do, it's just, give me, some, give me something else inky. Like, just, just be consistent, anyway. All right, so what's Clyde want to do? Catch Pac-Man. Technique is to be elusive. And the procedure is, so Clyde changes his persona based on his proximity to Pac-Man. And so the, the idea behind that is, I got to look at my notes here. If Clyde is more than eight tiles away from Pac-Man, then he takes on the persona of Blinky, which is just going to where Pac-Man is. If Clyde is less than eight tiles away from Pac-Man, 
he goes to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. So basically, Clyde becomes who he needs to be based on the situation which led my mind to social engineering, which honestly, we've been talking about the entire time with all these different, uh, the other types of uh, threats that, that, uh, that we've been talking through here. So I didn't wanna list the social engineering types that we're all familiar with, like, like fishing and spear fishing and whaling and things like that. But what I did wanna do is categorize them just to, to get us thinking about the different ways it can happen because again, at the end of the day, it boils down to making sure our users are aware of all the ways that um, they can be compromised that leads to a business compromise. And so we're all familiar with internet, email, phone, I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna get you to give me your credit card information, or I'm gonna email you, and I'm gonna give you the win and lottery numbers, or I'm gonna send you a cute kitty photo, and you're gonna click that link because you're having a great day and you just think it's your lucky day to be a millionaire, or you just can't resist kitties one or the other. Um, and then the internet, like what I was talking about with, uh, with search engine optimization and things like that. Human interaction. I was watching uh, 911 not too long ago. It's one of my favorite shows. It's so good. If you haven't watched it, you should. And then you can be very upset with me when you get addicted to it because there's like 13,000 seasons, but it's awesome. <laughs> one of the uh, individuals uh, on the show was uh, in a dating app. Met someone, talked to them for a couple weeks, Oh, I think I found my person. I'm so excited. We're going to go on a date. They go out. The guy gets beat up. Doesn't know why. And then a week later, in the 911 call center, there's a takeover. And so this guy was targeted so that they could not, not, not steal his key card. They made a copy of it because they knew if they took it, then that would alert, hey, something's going on, we need to like, you know, beef up security, but they took a copy of it, they had some machine, they copied it, and they put it back. And then they took over the 911 call center because they had access to the whole building because this guy was pretty high up in the company. That all started with an online dating app. So how much research did this attacker do on this individual to set up a profile that this individual would find attractive and then have these conversations to keep them engaged and go on a date with them? I mean, that's a commitment, right? These attackers are, are committed, and the, but these things can happen. And it's, it's hard to say, hey, don't, don't be paranoid. We still want to live. But I mean, by some stretch, we kind of have to be. You know, I, I am still kind of in the camp of trust but verify but I'm definitely not full on in the, in the trust camp. I, I, I do verify everything, really, really leaning more toward pessimism and, and paranoia the more I read what's going on um, in the world. So, and then passive, that's like shoulder surfing. So I'm gonna stand over your shoulder, pretend I'm talking to you about the weather while you're typing in your password, or I'm gonna ask you for direction somewhere when you're putting your, your pin in uh, at an ATM and things like that. So, um, these are the categories I think it's really important when we're communicating with our users the types of things that they need to look out for. I think our users are wired to just think about phishing. Let me just make sure I'm not clicking on a bad link, but I mean, it's, it's way bigger than this. And then something I didn't touch on when I was talking about ransomware, I actually want to go back to that for a moment, is, you know, we, we say cybersecurity isn't an IT problem, it's a business problem, and that's true, but it's becoming more than that. It's becoming a matter of human life, it's becoming a matter of human safety, right? You think about the pipeline hack that had people going to the gas station literally filling up plastic bags with gasoline for fear of running out of gas. I live in Greensboro, South Carolina, so it happened in my backyard, and it was pretty crazy, and you had airlines that had to ground planes because they couldn't get fuel for the jets and things like that. But then you also read stories like the lady that died on her way to a second hospital after she was turned away from the first hospital she went to because they were under attack from ransomware. That's the first case, at least in my research, that was reported as ransomware being linked to the death of, of a human. And it's, it's getting really serious. Um, it is really about more than um, corporate sustainability. It's about more than protecting brand and, and corporate reputation. It, it really is a matter of, of human life. And I was in the elevator this morning, and, and a gentleman got in, and he said, how many people are at this summit? I was like, oh, quite a few. He's like, that's great. The Cyber Summit's great. We definitely need more people for protection. 
I was like, yeah, that's right. We're like the modern day warriors. We're going to do this thing. But it's true, right? We have to be. I think gone other days or going are the days of, of boots on ground and, and kind of fighting, fighting the war that way. The war is increasingly becoming digital and, you know, all of us are, are the warriors and we have to make sure what we're, we know what we're looking out for and doing the right things. So, leveling up. How do we do that? We got to go back to basics. Do not roll your eyes when I say people, process, technology. Okay, you can roll your eyes. I get it. We've been talking about it forever, but it's still, it, it's not that we need to stop talking about that and start talking about something else. I think we need to continue talking about these things, but we need to make sure we're talking about everything that we need to be talking about, considering all the things that we need to be considering, and not just doing things the way we've always done them. We need to ask the hard questions. We need to ask, why are we doing this this way? Is this the right process? Is this the right procedure? So just keeping with the theme for a second, if I, if I turn things on myself and for, for, for Pac-Man for a moment, and think about a people perspective. All right, so how, how can I get better? Or do I just suck at this game? Should I go play Fogger or something like that? From a process perspective, do I have the right strategy? Should I be approaching this a different way? Do I, enough, do, do I know enough about these ghosts, right, to, to level my game up and, and perform better next time? And then from a technology perspective, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you a quick story. So, at the beginning of COVID, I was traveling all the time. I think if I was home three days a week, I was, I was having a good week. So needless to say, when travel was shut down, I was home, I was, kind of, I was kind of lost. Like everyone had their little corners, their little things that they did at the end of the day. And I'm sitting there like, I, I need something to do. So I'm a project person. I built an arcade in my basement. So I got these quarter cades from Arcade 1-Up. I got Pac-Man, I got Mortal Kombat, I got Street Fighter and Marvel. It's awesome. I didn't get a lot of work done when I first finished it, but I've, I've gotten it together now, I'm much better. Um, but when I got it all set up, I was playing uh, Pac-Man and Frogger because I wanted to show my youngest son what a boss I am at these games. And I lost both of the games at like level three. And I was upset. And my first comment was, oh, this joystick is garbage. I need a new joystick. It's trash. And the funny thing is we do that a lot in cybersecurity. We have a problem and we turn to tech. But then tech becomes a problem because we have tool sprawl. Our tools are making too much noise. We don't know what to do with the information coming out of them. So I do think that, I mean, don't get me wrong, technology does solve problems, but it doesn't solve all problems. And we need to make sure we're solving the right problems. So focusing on people from a cybersecurity perspective, of course, um, I'm going to get into the communication bit in a second, but just really pushing on user education and awareness. Our users cannot be responsible for information that they don't have. We can't assume our users know anything. We wake up in this world every day. We live in this world. We're reading the news, but our users are looking at cat videos and shopping on eBay and Amazon and looking for PowerPoint templates to get their job done. So we have to take it upon ourselves to tell them what to look out for, but we also have to communicate with our users in a way where this information is, is gonna stick. I was uh, speaking on a panel last week and I made the joke that the only thing I liked about security awareness training a couple years ago at my company was the fact that we got free pizza because who wants to go to security awareness training, right? And everyone laughed, but it's true. You know, what are our users actually getting out of our security awareness training programs? Are we training them on the right things? So I really just kind of wanted to, wanted to touch on that because the way we train our users are the way our users are, are going to respond. It's just like pro athletes. I don't know what the heck's going on with Kansas City, but I think they might need to train a little differently because they don't look like the team they looked like last year or the year before, I'm just saying. Okay, we can cut that part out of the recording because right, that's, that's my wife's favorite team, so I didn't say that. Um, so anyway, getting to what I have up here. Communication within our security teams, communication across the business from our security teams. I think, and this is, this is world according to Tia, that a big challenge we have in the cybersecurity industry right now is the fact 
that cybersecurity is seen as a separate discipline, when in actuality, it's an overlay of every other function of IT. And I feel like that we should treat our security teams that way and our business instead of all of these organizational units and here's the security team over here. Our security teams should be an overlay to every function of the business. It drives awareness, it drives communication, it, has the secu it puts the security team in a position to be seen as a business enabler instead of a roadblock, and it just fosters a feedback loop that can help mature security programs um, tremendously. So along those lines, you know, here, here's some considerations for, for getting that done. When you establish your programs, when you establish your processes, and you determine what your approaches are, begin with the end in, in mind. What are we trying to accomplish here? And that's what you need to work towards. I think I'm, I'm guilty of this too. As a technical individual myself, I'm focused on, well, how am I going to get there? What, what are you going to do? and I'll get wrapped around the actual on features and functionality and how does it deploy and how much does it cost and what's it take to rip it out. And I'm not thinking about, I'm thinking more about the moment that I'm in instead of where I'm trying to go. And that leads to sometimes not making the best decisions for our teams and for our organizations because ultimately, I, I don't care if you're studying for a Security Plus, a CISSP, a CISM, all of the answers come to, to the questions, come back to, are you really focused on protecting your users and aligning the business outcomes? That's at the end of the day. That's, that's what it is, all right? So to the second point of speaking the language that needs to be spoken, my famous line with this is, if you are a security leader, you cannot speak to your CFO who's listening in dollars and cents in terms of bits and bytes. You will never be able to communicate. You will never get buy-in. It'll be hard to get funding, so you have to speak according to who you're speaking to in the language of the listener, critically important. And that's your users as well. So if a user says, well, why can't I do this on my computer? You can't say, well, because if you aggravate the flux capacitor, then we're just gonna have to go back to the drawing board and we're gonna have to deploy this and do that. And it's gonna take weeks and like they don't care about that. All they want to do is finish their PowerPoint presentation so they can get back to their kitty videos. And so we have to explain to them their role in protecting the business. It's our responsibility to make sure that security and protection of our organizations is in the DNA, literally in the DNA of, of our users. And so that's what I mean, speak the language that needs to be spoken. It's our job to make sure everyone is picking up what we're putting down or we're not going to be able to move our organizations or this industry forward. And the last point, remain focused on the desired outcome. Now this ties back to the, big, the first one, begin with the end in mind. We know the path we're going down, don't get lost on that path. Have you ever said, I wanna take a vacation. I wanna go to Miami, I'm gonna sit on the beach, have a few drinks and just relax. Then you open up your laptop and you start looking at flights and you start looking at hotels and you start looking at rental cars and you go on vacation in Colorado, and you're skiing, it's you and 15 friends, this is not what you had in mind, but you got wrapped around the axle into details and you ended up somewhere that you did not originally intend. And that happens a lot of times in our programs as well. And um, the big one I like to talk about here, and that's gonna get us to, to process where we need to focus on outcomes, and that is literally how we are managing our cybersecurity programs. What is the point of that? Our goal in all things is to reduce organizational cyber risk. And I say cyber risk specifically, right? Because if we're focusing on the threats in our environments, if we're focusing on our users, we have to say cyber risk, or because if, if you just say risk, it just blows up. Now we gotta talk about compliance, and we have to talk about reputation, we have to talk about all these things. So we stay focused on cyber risk, okay? making sure that we're leveraging the right processes and programs and management capabilities to get the job done. And so the goal here is actually 
from, it's a combination of the definition from ISC squared on what risk management is with a little something tossed in that, that I'll tell you about in a second. So the goal is a cost-effective approach to cyber risk management that enables security teams to quantify and measure cyber risk in risk-reducing terms. So yesterday, some of the audience asked the keynote, said, hey, I have to start presenting to my board, and, and I don't know what to, what to show them. Where do you recommend I start? And I thought the answer was spot on. It was, first off, do not report to your board in terms of technology metrics. Don't say, we're deploying this endpoint, and we've got 700 out of 1,000 endpoints deployed. The board's going to say, OK, so what? Right? So we have to make sure that we, we are artic articulating the appropriate information. And Gartner released a report recently on the top uh, security trends of 2021. And one of the things on that list was cybersecurity savvy boards, which does not mean our boards are going out and getting certifications and cybersecurity degrees, but they are adding expertise in cybersecurity to the board. And the way that they want cybersecurity program effectiveness communicated is in risk reducing terms. So if we're not actually reducing risk in our environments, we're not going to be able to communicate that to our boards. And where I'm going with this in terms of process and focusing on outcomes, there is a great debate in the best approach to cybersecurity management or risk management. And the two most debated are the maturity-based approach and the risk-based approach. Compliance-based is another approach, but I think that one is a little less um, uh, convoluted or brought into the argument because it's clear right, what, that, what that's intended to do. But if you think about it, think about all three of them. Being compliant does not mean I'm secure. Being secure or reducing my risk does not mean I'm compliant, okay? And being mature doesn't mean I'm doing any of them. Now, you may be regulated to uh, have to demonstrate your maturity, and that's fine. If that's your outcome, know that that is your outcome and align your program to that. But if it's reducing risk, don't chase maturity, don't chase compliance. Quantify the risk in your environment, establish your baseline, establish your KPIs, and then build a program that allows you to articulate the reduction of that risk over time. I could, talk about, I could have talked about this for an hour, <laughs> because I think as an industry, we're getting it very wrong. And it's not us, it's just that in an industry where things are changing every day, how can you possibly have enough data to make the right decisions all the time, right? So we just have to get to something that makes us comfortable based on our understanding of our environment, the threats that our environments face, what our business priorities are, and what the risk profile of our organization is, and that's our organization's risk appetite and risk tolerance. And we have to build a program around those things. The challenge with this is every organization has different priorities. Every organization has different uh, resources available to them. Some are endless, some are limited, some are kind of sad. And we have to work through those things, right? So there's, it's difficult to standardize on what we should all be doing. And that's why, back to, to my last point of communication, we have to over-communicate and remain focused on the outcomes. Why does, the, why does our security team exist? What are we here to do? Are we actually doing those things? Or are we just getting wrapped around the axle with things that are distracting us? Technology. This one. Well, let me talk about what's on the slide first before I get distracted and start rambling. So if you've not seen this slide, this is Momentum Cyber's Cyberscape. And what they do is they take all the vendors and they put them in categories. So we have this view of all the security vendors that we can choose from. And this is tools, this is uh, service providers, all these things. Now, if I'm a CISO or if I'm a VP of IT or a director of security and you give me this thing, I'm going to look at you and say, it looks like RSA or Black Hat threw up on a piece of paper. What am I supposed to do with this? But that is a problem that we have in this industry. And I will, we don't have to delete this. I'll go on record saying this. I've actually become very frustrated with where the industry has gone. Again, world according to Tia, it feels like it's more marketing than reality. And it makes it very difficult for buyers to understand what they should be evaluating, how they should be evaluating, and what's actually going to solve problems for them. And that results in just buying all the things to make sure you don't go to work and get fired because something blew up. 
And I think as vendors, we have to take on more responsibility of being very clear about the problems that we're solving for. And I feel like a lot of the, the power of, of delivering this messaging to, to organizations, to buyers, uh, to these companies that we are supposed to be protecting has been taken away from the solutioners um, and been placed more in the hands of revenue generators. And that is, that's going to be detrimental. It has been detrimental to our industry. Um, and that's why we end up with things that look like this. So technology, more tools, please, said no one ever. So. Let's make sure we're evaluating the tools that we have, the capabilities of the tools that we have. Are they doing what we need them to do? Is it actually doing what I was told it was gonna do when I purchased it? Is it solving the problem that it needs to solve? Do I need to add more technology or can I cover this or, or solve this challenge with something that I already have? So in summary, as an industry, we need to step our game up. We have to be vigilant, we have to be strategic, we have to be smart. Otherwise, the ghosts in our machines are gonna own us and it'll be game over. And with that, I thank you for your time. I was going to say, I heard it's another way to get a sticker. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, either I nailed it or everybody's asleep with their eyes open. <laughs> Oh, man. You only pick one. My favorite cybersecurity tool. Holy cow. I might have to get back to you on that. That's a loaded question. But I'm going to say everything e Tire does. Because I'm a fan. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the easiest way is to take all of the um, really complex terminology that we use and figure out user level terminology that we can leverage in those conversations. Because for someone in, in accounting, right, it's very easy to say, well, you have access to financial data. And if that gets stolen, that's very bad. I think most people will understand that, right? But if we go in saying, well, you know, the information that you're, you're leveraging is stored on a file server that's hosted in AWS. So if you were to click on a link that then sent you to a malicious server that started, well, they're, they're already thinking about lunch. They're not listening to you anymore, right? So simpler the better. And what you find is when you connect with them, they connect with you. And when they understand, they want to know more. Because the, the very reason that social engineering is so successful is because people by nature want to help. And so if you enable them and empower them to help, then they will want to help more. So we really just have to, I don't want to say dumb it down because I don't think our users are dumb. I just think we need to do a better job of speaking their language in an endpoint. Yes, it's an endpoint because that's how we talk about it, but it's a, it's a computer to them. You say endpoint to someone in accounting, they might pick up a number two pencil and say this. Is that, is that what you're talking about, right? So we just need to be more aware. And if we are going to use that language, if we want to standardize on it, at the very least, educate our users on what we mean when we say that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah. All right, anybody else? So change management has been like a kind of a thorn in my side sometimes because like they'll ask you the details about like a project you're trying to implement, and they want they want you to be technical, they want you to be detailed, and then when I give them the technical and detailed information, they're like, uh, "What does SMB?" I'm like what? Hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I'm Give them, give them a glossary. <laughs> I mean, listen, if you're going to put, if they're asking for technical and then coming back and saying, I don't understand technical, then what that says to me is that the technical detail is a requirement. So it needs to be documented, but there's also the requirement that they understand it. So I think... I, I mean, glossary is a little sarcastic, but if they want that type of terminology in there, if they want you to say SMB instead of talking through it in terms of explaining what it is, then yeah, maybe either put in parentheses what that is, or here is an accompanying document to you know explore all of the technical terminology in here. And the, the thing is constant communication, right? If it's, here's what you asked for. No, I need something else. Okay, try this. No, I need something else. If you feel like you're banging your head against the wall, set up a meeting. Look, let's just sit down for an hour and read through this so you can tell me where I'm missing the mark, what you need more of, what you need less of, and that will save you so much time. And then you can go back and say, well, what do you mean you need something else? You told me, you need, I, I do this at home. You told me this is what you wanted, this is what I did. What are we talking about here, right? So once you've had that conversation and established this is how we're gonna work together, then it should be less friction for, for everybody. All right. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> their language, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure the ever elusive Inky. That makes sense for a fishing company. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Come on out. I can go across the room. All right. I'll be there in five minutes. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually quite common, and that's, that's why all the rave around um, security should be part of all processes, not an afterthought, because um, it's much more difficult to go back and add 
cybersecurity at the end or add secure coding at the end of building an application. And I think it really is a matter of restructuring the way um, I'll say the deliverables are met, right, when, when we are uh, developing applications. But it's challenging because software developers are software developers, not security professionals, right? And security professionals are security professionals, not software developers. And that goes back to my point that security is not a separate silo. It is not a separate function. It needs to be an overlay. So imagine if you were in an organization where software development was a team that partnered with a specific team in security or a couple of individuals in security and you guys got to talk through the things that you were doing and coding and they were helping you with things that you should think about and those were things that you could communicate back to the customer. So it really is a big issue industry-wide. Um, I think years from now, in any individual in IT doing any function of IT will have some sort of background understanding in security in the function that they perform, but today everything is so siloed, it is like taking a bunch of Legos and putting them together and deciding when to do it, so your, your problem is not uncommon. Stick it in the middle. <laughs> Clyde, you fixed it. <laughs> Thank you. I feel so much better. All right. Figured out the <laughs> Anyone else? Tia, awesome job. Right. Definitely enjoyed it myself. Right. Um, so appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.